to another RDWorks Learning Lab. We've had several attempts over the past year and a half to try and get to grips with 3D carving or 3D engraving. Now I had to put a lot of effort into discovering discrete parts to build up dot engraving. Now over time I've gathered lots of discrete pieces of information about this machine which possibly might contribute towards successful 3D engraving but there have been one or two key pieces that have been missing and it hasn't been until recently that I think I've discovered the missing links. Now this is going to finish up hopefully with successful 3D engraving but before we get in that direction I'm afraid we're going to turn in this direction and we're going to go off at a complete tangent because I need you to follow the strange thought processes and the strange discoveries that I've made and the links that will eventually hopefully get us back to successful 3D engraving. Now we're just going to have a little bit of a recap on our last session where <clears throat> we talked about the laser beam itself going into a lens and the laser beam remember has got a power distribution or a, an energy density distribution across it which is we keep talking about as a Gaussian distribution in other words it's more dense in the center of the beam than it is on the outside of the beam. And what we decided last time was that when the beam gets focused down like this to a very small point, the, although it is focused down to a very small point there, which may be as little as 0.1 diameter, in reality, the beam that comes out the other side is still like this. It's just that it's no longer six millimeters or eight millimeters diameter. It's actually 0.1 diameter. So when I measured at some stage the temperature with my thermocouple in this beam, I got about as far as there and I discovered 1300 degrees C before the tip melted off the thermocouple. What the temperature was right at the center of the beam I could never actually find out. So we have to assume that when the energy is focused down to a very small point, the temperature at this point here, the focused energy right down there, that temperature must be big. Who knows what it is? And I have no way of finding out because I haven't got any measuring equipment that will go up to thousands. Yeah, I do mean thousands of degrees C. That problem was bugging me. Now the great thing that I could see about this was that although we've got a nominal 0.1 beam diameter, when we start looking at the beam in these terms, this diameter here could well easily be 0.05 or even less to actually do our burning. Now the other thing that's important to remember is this and I do keep stressing this point because this beam is not a beam of heat. This beam is a beam of light and it's only when that light hits a surface does one of two things happen. Either the light gets reflected or it can get diffracted and reflected all over the place like this or it gets absorbed into the surface. That's the crucial word I mean, surface. You can't fire a beam of light into something that is solid. The only thing that can happen with a beam of light is it can interact with the molecules and atoms that are on the surface of the material that it's being absorbed into. And so that's the key mechanism that I want you to keep in mind all the time you think about this laser beam. It's surface contact only with solid material that causes something to happen. That's where the energy transfer takes place and it changes from light energy to heat energy. The atoms and molecules on the surface here become excited 
in the same way that, it do, that they do in a microwave oven when you fire um, energy at water particles. They become excited and they get hotter. And that's what happens here. The energy is transferred and it excites the molecules that are locally on the surface. They vibrate and get hot. Now, depending on what's underneath, some of that heat can be transferred away. But most of the materials that we're talking about firing this beam at are very, very poor conductors of heat. So the heat remains locally just in this surface area. And so what we've got to do is to examine what happens in that area there. Now, before we answer that question, I'm going to go off on another tangent. We're going further and further away from 3D engraving. Now, you've seen me do this before. This is molybdenum disulfide on a piece of stainless steel. And I'm going to etch something onto the surface of it. Now, what I want you to do is to watch and observe very carefully. Now, apart from the flames, what else did you see? Well, there is the end result. We need to remove the unused molybdenum disulfide from the surface to see the result. And there we go. A very nice black etched text. And we can scratch that text. It, it doesn't stand up above the surface. Well, we can scratch it quite hard and it doesn't come off. But somebody wrote to me and said, I've got an aluminium toolbox and I want to put some initials and I want to put some text on it. Um, I've tried to do it and it didn't come out right. Now, this is a stainless steel mug that has been powder coated and then it's been etched and the paint has actually been burnt off. And that was the effect that was trying to be achieved. I've just put some grey primer paint just ordinary cellulose primer on that surface there and this is a piece of aluminium. So we're going to try the same thing on here. Now again I would like you to make observations about what you can see. I'm not using any air assist on this at all. Mm. Well, I don't appear to have etched the paint off, but I won't know that until I try to take the paint off. Well, actually, I haven't done anything. So possibly this is the wrong sort of paint, or I'm not running it hot enough. Perhaps I've got to run it slower. Again, observation please. Possibly it's not the right sort of paint. Um, I don't have too many choices here, but in his particular instance, he was getting, you can see a hint of it here, he was getting the same sort of black text on his aluminium that I was getting on my stainless steel. And he was getting that from a normal cellulose paint that was sprayed onto the surface of his box. I did a little bit of, um, a little bit of research to see if somehow I could relate these subjects together. And what I've got here is just ordinary sulphur powder. Now, what I'm going to do hmm. not very evenly spread, I'm afraid. I'm going to have to try that again. Let's drop it from a further height. 
see if we can get a slight dusting. What I'm trying to achieve is a, a fairly even dusting of sulphur onto the surface. Okay, there's my thin film of sulphur powder on the surface. This time, because it's only powder, now, it's not quite as black as that one. But the point that I'm really trying to make there, there's some sort of chemical reaction taking place between the sulphur and whatever's in the stainless steel. The same applies to this one. And the same applies to this one in a different way. We'll go back and discuss those results in a minute. One other thing that I want to try that I have never attempted before, and this could be interesting, <laughs> we have here my engineer's oil can. I'm going to put a few blobs of oil on the surface there. I'm just going to spread it out a bit so that it's a film rather than a blob. might be good fun, I don't know. We might have some interesting results coming out of this. So that was molybdenum disulfide. That's ordinary engine oil. I did say we were going off at a bit of a tangent, didn't I? This is nothing like 3D engraving. There is a link for achieving these sorts of results. Other people have achieved it with, for instance, plaster of Paris. Somebody said they even used mustard. Well, all these things have got something in common. And that something in common is... So now we've got to go back and look at possibly what might be happening. I'm sorry this one didn't work properly but I've never tried it before. When I heard about this phenomena, that was when I began to realize that there was something rather interesting going on. Now, I'm gonna make no pretense about this. I am not a chemist. I'm an engineer. But throughout my career, I've dabbled in all sorts of disciplines. I've poked my toe and poked my nose into all sorts of things because I have an interest. Obviously, I know quite a lot about metals because that's been my background. Okay, so what's going on? Stainless steel contains about 17% nickel. And if you add sulfur to it and heat, you can generate nickel sulfide, I believe, or maybe nickel disulfide. Only the chemists amongst you will know that. I don't purport to be a chemist, so please excuse me. I'm looking at this in a very superficial way. All I can say is that this reaction requires heat of something at least 800 degrees C to happen, and it may well be even higher than that. Now, aluminium, with a cellulose paint, the cellulose will burn off quickly, and what it will leave behind is carbon. Now, aluminium and carbon will fuse together to make aluminium carbide. But that reaction requires something in the region of about 2,000 degrees C. The reason I'm linking all these things together is because what I'm trying to do is to, having established all these little teeny weeny bits of information coming in from different directions, it's beginning to give me an idea that the heat that we generate at this interface here, at the molecular interface between the light beam and the material, is at least 2,000 degrees C or more. Let's make an observation as to what happens when we start engraving wood. Can you see the flame, white flame? Now there's me going around trying to analyse at what temperature chemical reactions take place at, and yet there's a so-called elephant in the room. The answer to the question is actually staring me in the face. 
And there it is. White light. You do not get white light for free. Now I suspect many of you guys will have heard of Mr. Kelvin. He invented a temperature scale, which is, I say invented it. Um, it's the centigrade scale with an offset on it. And the offset takes the scale back to minus about 273 degrees C. Now, we talked about earlier how molecules are activated by heat. Basically, what this guy established was that when molecules actually stop moving, that's absolute zero at minus 270 degrees C, roughly. And as the temperature increases, so the molecular action starts increasing. And the hotter you make a molecule, the harder it vibrates. And the harder it vibrates, basically it's an indication of its temperature because it emits light. So let's just turn this scale around for a minute and take a look. Anybody that's interested in camera work will understand this scale immediately. Because here, midday sun, we're talking about an equivalent temperature, a white light temperature, of somewhere in the region of 5,000 to 6,000 degrees C. Now, but what I'm saying to you is that white light that we're seeing can only be caused by temperatures in this region. Now, I might be getting that wrong. Maybe there's some sort of fluorescent reaction taking place. Um, but at the end of the day, that's what this temperature scale gives me the impression is. We're generating heat of at least five to 6,000 degrees C for that reaction, for that light to be generated. Now, I don't think anybody will have any doubt as to what happens when you burn wood. Basically, you burn off the cellulose that's in the wood and what you're basically left with behind is carbon. Now, carbon is a very interesting material because it's one of the few materials, like acrylic, which sublimates. It doesn't turn into a liquid, it goes directly from a solid to a gas. And it does that at about 3000 degrees C. And so here we are coming back to our 3D engraving link. What I'm proposing to you is that this reaction that's taking place at the surface here is has got the potential for some incredibly high temperatures. Now remember the temperature is not dependent upon the material. The first thing that will happen is when the temperature is hot enough, maybe six, eight hundred degrees C, the actual wood will burn because that's the temperature at which wood burns. So what's left behind after wood burns? The answer is carbon. So that then means that what we're actually seeing, that white light, is probably the carbon burning and turning into a gas. Carbon arc, 3000 degrees C, that's very likely what we're seeing. Now something else that we may well have all observed when we're doing engraving is that if you engrave fast enough, you can finish up with quite a clean finish. But if you put too much power into it, you get this horrible charred look. So, I don't know, but I'm proposing. So, the way that my mind worked its way through all of this was to say that, well, hang about, I've had some pretty disastrous results with 3D engraving when I try and take too much off in one pass. Maybe that's where I'm going wrong. And what I should be doing is setting the power so that the laser beam comes in it reacts with the surface, burning away the cellulose, and then reacts with the carbon that's left behind to sublimate it, and leaves behind a nice clean layer. Now the only time that it's going to do that is if we get the power balance just right, i.e. we're moving at a speed whereby this reaction can take place just fast enough to get rid of the carbon as well as the cellulose that's in the mix and leave behind a nice clean layer. If we go too slowly we shall go through and we shall burn the material that's underneath. 
and we shall leave this horrible black mess behind. Now, that's the picture that I see in my mind. And now we've got to go about seeing whether or not we can prove that, because if we can, there are several opportunities for us to move forward on 3D engraving. I'm going to go away and we're going to develop a series of little simple tests to investigate this. OK, now I've, I've written a little program um, which I've described to as it's working and I've got a piece of MDF here because that's the material that I'm going to try and do some 3D engraving on because it is basically, it hasn't got a grain structure and it should work quite well. I've never been successful with MDF so this will be a real test as to whether or not we can get some 3D engraving done on MDF. But before we start 3D engraving we've got to do a lot more work. And that's 10% power out of my 70 watt tube because of the non-linearity of the power that comes out of the tube. So I would expect that probably 50 and 65% are going to look very, very similar. You can see from the smoke debris how the burning is taking place and how much fumes we're producing, even though, I mean, I haven't got a full cross flow on here um, at the moment, so we've got probably more debris on the end here than I would normally have because I'd want to be sweeping it away. But look at this first cut. No burning in it at all. The second cut, yeah, burning and a little teeny weeny bit of debris out the ends and then it starts to get really, really bad. OK, well let's now do 200 millimetres a second. Well, I think you can see this time, look, we're getting some little bit of spray at the end on these three. So we've made an improvement by going faster and as you can see, We've got lighter on the first one, we've done virtually nothing there. That second one is not, it's a little bit darker than that first one there. So let's push on a little bit further and we'll go up to 300 millimetres a second. The noise of that tells me that's still in the, uh, the top end of the pre ionisation zone because of the noise. Compare it to the next one. The cutting is virtually silent there. It's only the switching on and off of the beam that you can actually hear. And this is 400. Now you notice at 400 we've got a heck of a lot more over travel. Well here's a summary of all the results. This is the calibration graph for the tube. It basically shows the watts that are coming out of the tube for the percentage programmed percentage power along the bottom here. So as you can see, the tube output is very non-linear. These values down the side here are these black dots, the percentage up the calibration graph. And down on this one here, I've got the actual nominal watts that come out of the tube. Now obviously those watts will be decreased after they've passed through three mirrors and a lens, but these are only for relative comparison purposes. OK, now what we've got here is depth of cut across the bottom. And this is only the depth of cut for this bottom one. OK, so this one with a one and a half inch lens running very slowly at 100 millimetres a second digs in a millimetre. But my goodness me, look at all the crud that's left in the bottom there. That is loose. Look, I can scrape it away. 
Can you see that? Look. So there is a huge amount of carbon left in the bottom there. So it's pierced right through the carbon and then probably when I look in there that's nearly probably 1.5 millimetres deep. Okay, now that's the worst situation. Some of these others have still got, yeah, they've still got carbon in them. Some of these, they've got residual carbon sitting in the bottom. And anything with that sort of debris in it, I'm not really interested in. So I think nearly everything that's here on this one and a half inch lens is no good in my terms. We're trying to use the whole range of available power and we've got nothing there with a one and a half inch lens at any speed that I would consider to be usable for 3D engraving. So let's throw that one away. Now this is the two inch lens and well yeah th this is although it's dark it hasn't got any loose carbon in the bottom there. I can scratch it but that is because what's actually in the bottom there are cuts like that and what I'm doing I'm scratching the top off of the cuts but you see we've only got 0.03 depth of cut there that's not a huge variation although we've got we've got quite nice color across the whole of that range there I mean these are very nice but look we've only got 0.01 depth of cut in there it's it's virtually nothing it would take me absolutely ages to create a 3d drawing using that And so is that one nice? But I think on balance, the only suitable one, in my opinion, for doing 3D engraving, the best that gives the best compromise. I mean, the colour change here is quite large. And we have got some loose debris in the bottom there, as you can see, which I can scratch. This one, virtually nothing. So, although it's only 0.1, it's going to take 10 cuts to get a millimetre. So it's either a speed of 200 millimetres a second with a 2 inch lens, or 200 millimetres a second with a 2.5 inch lens. The difference between the two of them is very small. And I think on balance, I would probably go for the 2.5 inch lens, surprisingly enough, because there is less colour variation, i.e. there's less burning difference between the first and the last. Whereas here, we've got a bigger colour range. And there's virtually no difference in the depth of cut. That one is about 0.09 and that one is 0.1. So what that forces me to do is to take lots of cuts, but hopefully I'm not going to produce debris at each cut. We shall have to see, because maybe this effect here is cumulative on every cut. I think it's rather interesting that you can see across these, that, uh, these three lenses, you can very distinctly see the difference in the power density. This one, if we regard this as an energy density of one, this is an energy density of a half, and this is an energy density of a quarter. Now this is the calibration for my China Blue machine, which is a 70 watt Mactron tube. And basically what this drawing shows you, in case you've not seen this before, is along this bottom scale here, we've got programmed percentages. Now when you ask for 50%, you might think you're asking for 50% watts. Wrong. You're asking for 50% of the maximum current that your high voltage power supply can deliver. This red line here is milliamps. This is the current that your power supply can deliver. And as you can see, it's virtually a straight line, which makes sense because it's got to run from 0% to 100%. And that's what this percentage along the bottom here is calling for, the percentage of the 
current that can be delivered by your power supply. The power output from the tube is totally non-linear. And so up this scale here, we've got it's dual scale. It can either be 20 milliamps, which runs across here, or it can be 20 watts, which is on this scale. So the numbers are the same, but they apply to two different scales. So I'm going to put some marks on here, some basic marks to start with. The maximum power that I can put through my tube is 22 milliamps, which is there. And at 22 milliamps, what that means is I will be able to expect a power out of my tube of that much. And I will get that power at 68%. And that happens to be around about 72 watts. And this is 22 milliamps. So that defines the maximum delivery that I can get from my tube. 72 watts at 22 milliamps, which is equivalent to 68% on my programmed percentage scale. OK, now... Down at the other end of the scale here, things start getting a bit complex because we've got this so-called pre-ionisation zone where things get a bit fuzzy. Um, certainty starts to come in, although it's still in the pre-ionisation zone, certainty starts to come in at around about 10% power. At 10% programmed power, I'm actually getting somewhere in the region of about 8 watts out of the tube. It will go a little bit below that, but it's a bit flaky. So consequently, I'm going to start this whole graph off at 10%. And I'm going to draw this line up here. So let's draw a line between those two points. Is at this end, 72 watts. If I was doing grayscale engraving, 72 watts would be a heavy burn, and you would class that as being black. And of course, down at this end, we've got virtually no burn, so we'll call that white. And so that line, that black line up there, represents my grey scale, which basically runs between 255 white and zero, which is black. And there are 255 increments along there for the different scales of grey. So what happens here is my white starts off correct at white, but then it starts to get black a lot quicker than it should do because I'm putting more and more power in as opposed to what I should be putting in. So this is the correct power line to get a linear burning relationship between white and black, but this is the real burning power that I'm going to get. We've got to generate a calibration graph that will somehow distort our pictures before we allow them to go into grayscale engraving. Now I'm going to show you a way that we can do that. You could try and do all sorts of calculations but within Photoshop we have the ability to actually distort the grayscale and I'm going to show you a fairly simple method of how you can do that. It is possible to do something similar in GIMP but I'm afraid GIMP hasn't got the same tools available. There is a curve distortion tool but you can't correct it exactly. It's very much more guesswork. The correction factors that we need run between 0 and 100 Although we've got 0 to 255 for the grayscale, forget the grayscale for a minute. What we're really going to do is to put in some numbers to correct this curve. And it doesn't matter how many points we put up here to cause this correction to take place. It could be 2, which would be pretty crude. It could be 50, which would take a long time. OK, well, I've done all the boring drawing work now. Put a scale across this graph now. Um, and it runs from 0 to 100%. And what we're now going to do is to consider what happens up this straightforward 0 to 255 
grayscale line. Let's just look how I've managed to get this correction calibration sorted out from this graph. Let's take this 30% line, for example. Where the 30% line crosses the true linear grayscale line, what I've done, I've projected back to the power curve. And that's at this point just here. Now, when we start looking along the uh, the percentage scale along the bottom, forget about the numbers that are hidden in there because they're no longer valid. We're talking about something different now. We're not talking about programmed percent. We're talking about a scale that runs 0 to 100% for this graph. And what we find is at 30%, when we follow it across, we finish up with a real number of 10%. So the intersect is actually 10%. And similarly, if we choose another number, let's take 65%, for example, up here. We follow the 65% line up to here. Then we project it across to the watts line. And it's approximately halfway between these two, um, 30 and 35. So really, it's 32 and a half. But we can't have 32 and a half. We have to have a whole number. So we've made it 33. Could have made it 32, but it looks as though it's slightly more towards 33. It really isn't that important if we're half a digit out somewhere. The idea is that we're trying to basically grossly correct this error here. And so now we've got two sets of numbers. We've got an input number and an output number. And so we need to go back now to Photoshop and have a look at how we're going to use this corrected data. OK, now before we go any further, what I'll do, I'll show you where I get these special 3D engraving bitmaps from. Um, if you go into Google and put this into your search bar, you'll come up with this. If you click on the pictures, this particular company here have got f free images that you can download or another way of doing it is the way that I tend to do it um, for my own personal use. Something like this particular one is if you click on that one it will take you to Simlas and although you can see the eagle there don't go to that one. View more and we shall see several eagles here. This one is from CNC zone and if you look it's 250 by 250. This one is 833 by 1000. So that's a much more, that's a much higher resolution picture. So that's the one that I'm going to choose. So I'm going to click on that. So I can now save this image as a JPEG file and uh, open it up in Photoshop. Now before we do the uh, the correction factors one other thing that I'd like to just point out to you is if we go up here to image adjustments and levels, this is a histogram of all the various shades of grey and the amount of shades of grey in the picture. At the moment there are just a few whites showing right at this end here. Now the problem with white, absolute white, 255, is that it will switch the laser off. When we look at our calibration graph our starting point is not zero it's actually about eight or nine watts and so anything that's white will be nothing it will be engraved and left on the surface the last thing you really want is white 255 in your picture so what we can do here we can say that we want the output levels to run from zero which is black to two we can make it 250 for example the loss of just a few white levels will not have any significant effect on our picture as you can see there. And now we're going to go to image again, adjustments, and we go to curves. This particular tool is quite a powerful tool because first of all I can change this round so that I can start from black at the bottom as opposed to white. Um, but in fact the way that we've got our graph drawn 
it's this way round with white down at this bottom left hand corner. So what we can now do is we go back and refer to our graph that we developed. And although I put 20 points on there, 5, 10, 15, 20 percent, I put all the 5 percent. I think we will just do the 10 percent marks uh, because th this graph doesn't need that number of points to get it approximately where we want it. So we'll put a click on there and then we can change that input first of all to the input which is 10 percent and its related output which was 4 percent. Okay so already as you can see we've changed the picture we've made it lighter and we've got a curve starting. So we can put another point on there and this time we'll do the 20 percent 20 percent and 7 so 20 percent and seven. And then we'll stick another point on there and 30% and 10. So that's what it was and that's what it now is now that we've distorted the white range. Now they do look like a few kinks in there which I'm not sure it really matters what we can do is if we want we can just very slightly straighten this graph out like that just so that it's a nice smooth curve and now what we can do is we can save this and I'll save it there as a China blue and what this means is now I can say OK so I bring in a new file now and the first thing that I can do is go to image, adjustments, curves, and now I can load my China blue. And there we go. So it automatically corrects any other drawing that I bring in to suit the power curve that I've just set up. So we can always see what the original is by turning off the preview. But that's the modified file. So if we say OK, I can now save that file as, oh, I've saved it as Eagle China Blue. There we go. Save. Well, we've run on quite a long time uh, in this session, so I think this is a convenient point to break. So next time we'll carry on with parameter setting and programming, and then we'll see what success we've got. Have we reached the end of the road? Can you carry on on your own with all this information? We shall see. Until then, goodbye.